Well, good morning. It's great to see you guys this morning. Good to have you here, and what a wonderful job. Ernie, thanks for filling in. Denise is out of town this weekend, and he hates being recognized, but his sister is here and told me that I better recognize him. She did not. So, um, you ever have a couple bucks? You ever have somebody come up to your window while you're driving? You're not sure what you should do? They got the sign, you know, it says, uh, we'll work for food. So you're offering them a job, and they say, I won't work for food. Or you give them food, and they throw the food away. That happened to my son. And so, if you're not careful, you'll become callous to people who have needs because you get hurt by people. Who needs a dollar? Anybody in here need a dollar? Need a dollar? I don't, I don't have a five. I got... I got a one, and since you're a tax collector, I should give it to you anyway. You need a dollar. Marcus has got a dollar. That's, oh, she had her hand up first. I'm sorry. She can share it with you, though. Just oh, she said give it. She said to give it to you. Jane, you get extra credit. All right, that's the sermon. Have a great day. So today we're going to talk about. Uh, um, a story uh, that whether it's a, uh, a, a parable or whether it's a story, doesn't really matter. What's funny about all of the commentaries is they love to argue about that. Uh, but Rodney, it's what you talked about. We're going to look at the life to come, and we're going to talk about that for just a minute today. Uh, when I was a kid, I worked uh, during the summer. Um, uh, they would let me work down at the church some. And, uh, so, and I would come in and actually come in every Sunday morning and turn on the air conditioners early. That was my job, which was awesome. So you basically, I had to come in at like 6 in the morning in Miami, turn on the air conditioner, peak, and one at a time, because FPL would charge us for any peak. And it was back in the old days, they had a, a thing that did that, and it would crank up the price. And so they actually saved money by hiring me. But one of the things about being down in the church a lot is I saw homeless people. We were right off US-1, and homeless people would come in. Uh, uh, asking for a handout, not just homeless people, other people. And so I remember, and the pastor would take me to lunch once in a while. And uh, so I remember one day the pastor took me to Burger King, the first Burger King in the country down there in Kendall, Florida. I don't know if you've ever been there. And I actually got to be in the Burger King, first Burger King kids club. And I actually was one of the ones that they, they would try out new toys and, and send them to me and then call me to ask me how the new toys were. And that was, tell me, this is an awesome job. I never told you that story. So it's kind of cool. There's a fan up here running. Do you want my hat too, that, with the spinner? Somebody said to me, is there a spinner on that hat? I've been wearing it for six weeks. And they just now noticed. You just, just hold it. It's fine. Um, anyway, so, um, so one day he took me to Burger King. And as we were sitting there, we were kind of over in the back. And the pastor and I were talking. And I was getting, um, eating a, a Whopper. And I had it my way. And... Um, uh, I always liked onion, their onion rings better than their fries. I'm just saying. Uh, especially now they got the dipping sauce. Man, I'm making myself hungry. I'm going to Burger King for lunch. Uh, I don't know. So p- pastor, the pastor and I were sitting there. Pastor, His name was Merle, by the way. You try to say that three times fast. So Merle and I were sitting there. And he didn't mind being called by his first name, which was weird for me. Because, you know, I grew up. My parents didn't like me to call him Merle. But he didn't like me to call him Pastor Boytnot. And that last name's hard to say, so I just called him Merle. And uh, so Merle and I are eating some lunch, and uh, all of a sudden, we hear somebody yelling at the cashier, saying, I don't want this food. This is terrible. You guys didn't make it right, and have it your way. And, and all of a sudden, Merle just gets up and t- walks off, which is weird. He doesn't say a word, just walks off. And I'm like, what's going on? Now, here's what happened. They had been taken advantage of so much at the church by people wanting money and then going out and buying whatever uh, that they started giving out uh, coupons to Burger King. And so this guy who the pastor had helped that morning had come into Burger King, gave him a coupon, and then wanted a cash refund. Yeah, so that kind of stuff will get you, get you bitter. My, my favorite story, uh, uh, which kind of shows you Merle's heart, is there was a family that came in, and I don't know if you've dealt with this, but a, a family in a van came in, and they needed gas money. Now, back then, gas was like 87 cents a gallon. And uh, back in the old days, back way before you guys were driving. Anyway, so, uh, um, and uh, gas was so much cheaper that we had engines that were bigger than our car. 
Bill, those were more fun to work on too, weren't they? A lot more fun. Okay, so anyway, so it's not going to be long. All we're going to hear, it's going to, everybody's going to sound like a golf cart everywhere. But anyway, so um, they're going to have to put a stereo in that goes, vroom, vroom, so we'll feel manly. But anyway, so, sorry, so this has nothing to do with anything, and I shouldn't have had so much coffee, and definitely shouldn't have had that donut. Okay, so what did you say about Prozac <laughs> earlier? <laughs> okay, <laughs> he didn't share. Uh, so... Anyway, so the, so the pastor, this family comes in and they needed gas money. They had to get back to grandma. They had the best story, best story. And so the pastor, he was so tenderhearted and he was so good. And so the family said, hey, you know what we've got? We've got scuba gear that we used to go down to the key. So we will give you the scuba gear as collateral if you'll give us $500. The scuba gear is worth a lot more than that and blah, blah, blah. So the pastor, being tenderhearted, gave him 500 bucks. And the people left. And then... Uh, uh, he had this stuff sitting somewhere, uh, like not in his office, but like where you could walk by and see it. And a police officer who went to our church came in and said, oh, that's stolen equipment from this shop that got robbed recently. And he had lent money to burglars and uh, never was going to see it again. And so when you grow up in that environment and see that, it's very easy to start to say, bunch of crooks. It's, it's, well, it's kind of like what I say about politicians. Uh, but did I say that out loud? That meant to stay inside. By the way, one of my earliest memories as a child is my dad yelling at Nixon on TV. So, so I get it natural. Uh, anyway, so I know that it's easy to look at this story and think this guy's being punished because he's rich or he's being punished because he has money, but yet there's all kind of people, including Abraham, that were very wealthy in Scripture. It is not money that is evil. Remember, Jesus just talked about that. It is the love of money that's evil. And so we've got to be really careful as we read this story. But here's the thing. The Pharisees and the Sadducees each had misconceptions about eternal life. The Sadducees believed that life was just over when it was done and didn't believe in the resurrection at all. And, and, and the Pharisees thought, well, if I've got money on this earth, it demonstrates that God's blessing is on me. By the way, I've heard TV preachers say that. And they'll say things like, you should have the best life now because that's what God wants you to have, which kind of this story is going to go exactly opposite of what that says. So here we go. We're going to talk about three rules today for eternity. Number one, Money won't save you. So Jesus had just told parables about money. We talked about those the last few weeks. Um, and so I've done a sermon on money, and today I'm going to talk about hell. You guys will never come back to church. Actually, I don't think I'm coming back next week. I think I'm done, <laughs> done here. But I think you'll enjoy how the end we end up today. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple. This guy was formerly known as rich man. Think about it. Who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Time out. So purple was very expensive. They had to like squeeze snails or something to make purple dye. And it was super expensive. That's why Lydia in the Bible supported the early disciples. Women, by the way, supported financially the early gospel. If you didn't know that, Google it. And it's absolutely true. And it's in the Bible. And so uh, Lydia was a seller of purple. It's also my daughter's name. And... Uh, uh, but, but here, it says he's wearing purple every day, which means that the dude dressed up every day. How many of you like to dress up? We live in Florida, so there's like five people. Okay? And if you like to dress up, then why are you... Never mind, okay. By the way, you're welcome to wear a suit, dress, whatever you want to our church. We don't care. It's wonderful. And on Easter, people wear suits and flip-flops. It's just a great place to be. This guy is true, isn't it? I would love to say that's a lie, but it's absolutely true. And, and um, I can't say much because I'm wearing... So my socks match that I'm wearing today. And these are penguins. And um, these are seagulls. It's the bird theme. It's not color coordinated. It's bird coordinated. So anyway. Okay. I've got to like preach. It was the donut. Where's Twyla? <clears throat> At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores. This is a different Lazarus than the Lazarus who's risen from the dead, by the way. <clears throat> covered in sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. You've ever been so hungry that even what dropped off of somebody said, that's how he was. 
Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. Time out. So this guy went from at the gate. By the way, rich man, he's at his gate. So the rich man literally is stepping over him every day, ignoring him. Like some of the husbands do with shoes that are in the walkway. Right? Those dirty clothes that they didn't know. The dishes. Right? Just didn't notice it. This man was like that. He just didn't pay any attention to him. And what happens? He dies, and the Bible says the angels escorted him to heaven, which is awesome. And let me give you just two quick points from this. Number one is the Pharisees assumed that because the man was poor, that he would go to hell. And that that meant he wasn't blessed. And Jesus immediately changed that and says the angels escorted him to heaven. The second thing you'll notice is, you ready for this? The angels are his escort. When you die, don't say you become an angel. I, I know people say that and I never correct them. Don't go to a funeral and tell people they're not your angel. But the truth is, an angel's a downgrade for you as a Christian. The angels now are your escort. Jesus called his disciples his friends. He never calls the angels his friends. The angels are his servants and we get to be his friends. So the angels come and now, you know, they're transporting. They're, they're making sure they're taking him to the kingdom to be at Abraham's side. And by the way, the whole idea of Abraham was the religious leaders always used Abraham as their, hey, we're children of Abraham. That was kind of their big deal. So the fact that this poor guy's going there, the Pharisees and Sadducees are already freaked out by this story. And then it continues. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades where he was in torment. He looked up and he saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. The guy he had ignored his whole life. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Now, here's what's amazing. <laughs> the, the rich man didn't ask to get out of hell. And he saw Lazarus the same way he always had. Lazarus, just a water boy. Get him to bring me you know, that guy who laid outside my gate, you know, I'm still the rich man. I'm, I'm down here in hell, but get him to bring me just a little bit of water. Send him for water. Do you see the arrogance still in the rich man? The Pharisees and Sadducees looked at this story and thought, he's talking about us. And they started getting aggravated because they didn't like what he was saying. I can't help think of Ebenezer Scrooge, you know, right? Ebenezer Scrooge had the clerk. Remember the ghost takes him to Bob Cratchit's house? And he goes, I didn't know he had a son. You never asked. Is there anybody that you're ignoring around you? Now let me tell you one of the things as a church that we do and that you can do. I typically, very rarely, very rarely hand money to somebody. But I will support, and our church does support, organizations that help people, that can do a better job than I can, that do background checks on people and are able to give people things that I can't give to them in ways that I can't help them and are able to physically help people in ways that I can't. I give money to those organizations so then that I know the money is being multiplied and I'm not enabling somebody. Do you understand what I'm saying by that? And so one of the reasons we do the Super Bowl, S-O-U-P, if you did not notice the change of lettering. I think we get sued if we use the word Super Bowl now, right, or something. But the truth is, next week we'll have whatever two teams are left and we'll have bins for each of them. And all we're trying to do is make a fun way for us to help people who can be fed at the sharing center and food given to them. This week on Tuesday, I'll be going to the sharing center to help them unpack a trailer and help them pack some boxes to give to people. But I still will see the sign at the guy at the light and say, Holy Spirit, if you want me to give that guy some money, you better show me something. Because I've learned over the years from my pastor at home. <laughs> So I want to encourage you, don't be like the rich man who just steps over people in need all the time. 
Ask God, God, what do you want me to do? James 5, 5 says this, You've lived in earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fatted yourselves for the day of slaughter. Invest in eternity and help hurting people is your first challenge there in the notes. Invest in eternity and help hurting people. Listen to what Mother Teresa said. I love this. We know only too well that what we're doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean, but if the drop were not there, the ocean would be missing something. In Surfside, we say that we're riding the waves. It's not just because of our cool surf ministry that our folks back here run. It's because we want to do what God's called us to do and move forward in it, to ride the wave that God's put before us, what? To make a difference in our community, to help people to find their way home to Christ. But Eric, we're just doing a little bit. Yeah, so is everybody else. Number three. Number two. Hell is a real place of suffering. Now, I want to tell you what I know about hell. I don't want to go there. That's what I know. And let me tell you how I know that. Because my brother worked at a church that did... Uh, they, they try, you know, churches aren't allowed to have haunted houses. So they have to think of a spiritual way to head up a haunted house. So this church did something called Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And my brother said, you need to bring your youth group and go to this. So I did. I brought some of my youth. I went to the thing and we walk in and they start with a, a car with kids drinking. Right? And that's how they start. They have a little scene. It's like Disney World, right? So you got the kids drinking. And then they take us to the next scene. And now that car has been wrecked and all the kids are dead. This is going great, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks, brother. <laughs> then, then, you think that's bad. We walk into a dark room. They've got tape recorders playing people screaming. They've got open cans of tuna fish and salmon sitting in there. There is plastic on the walls and it's total darkness. And we are now in hell. And what happened is, I guess the group in front of us got stuck and they stopped and we didn't move. And I have never been claustrophobic until that day. To which I loudly said after about four minutes, if you don't get me out of here right now, all of this plastic is coming down. And somebody came and got me and took me out of hell. It was great. What's bad is I've been claustrophobic ever since. I can't even get an MRI anymore. I'm like, can you put me in feet first? Nope, got to put you in head first. Well, then you better knock me out. Because I'm not going to hell again. <laughs> Already been there once, right? Now, here's the good news. Here's what I said to the other youth leader who thought it was hilarious that I freaked out. I said, well, I'm not going there. That's wonderful news. I didn't even like recreated pretend hell. And listen to what happens next. So Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you're in agony. By the way, I would love to be able to tell you that there is no hell. I wish Jesus hadn't done this story. I probably could figure out some ways around, but I can't teach what the Bible doesn't say. There, listen, can I tell you that there's some things in the Bible I don't like, and this is one of them. I would love it to be that you die and you just get to go to summer school. Right? Purgatory? Summer school? And if you somehow in purgatory in summer school can earn your way to God, but I can't find that in the Bible. And Jesus is pretty clear here that that doesn't happen. I would love it to be about recreation. Like if you're a good person and you die, then you get to come back as a dog in my house because they have the best life there is <laughs> and if you're bad you get to come back as a one-legged duck just swim round and round and round right it's from an old isaac air freight skit I would love to tell you that's the way it is. But Jesus tells this story and he's telling spiritual truths for us to know. So he's telling us about eternity. And then he says this. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place. So those who want to go from here cannot, nor anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family because I have five brothers. Let him warn them. What's funny is the rich guy knows they're not listening to him. Why? Because they're his brothers. 
right? Your brother's here today. Did he ever listen to anything you said? Hardly, right? On, on occasion, well, you, he's doing, yeah, she's being nice about you today. We'll, we'll get the real story after church. You, yeah, yeah, you'll pay her later. And then he says, let him warn them why, so they won't come to this place. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. Now listen to what Jesus says next. Knowing that Lazarus, who's related to him, in just a few weeks, Jesus is going to raise him from the dead. And listen to what Jesus says next. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And that's exactly what happened because a few weeks later, Jesus, remember, Lazarus was dead. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus rose from the dead. And it says in Scripture that the religious leaders said, now we've got to kill Jesus because everybody's going to him. I mean, Lazarus is going down the road with Jesus. Probably still has some stuff wrapped around him like, look, dude, I was in the grave. And the Pharisee said, we got to take care of him. He came and said, it's real. And they said, no, it's not. You can't convince anyone that doesn't want to know about Jesus, about Jesus. But you can ask the Holy Spirit to convict them. You can ask the Holy Spirit to speak to them. You can ask that God would work on them. In Matthew 25, it says, the king will reply. This is Jesus telling another story. He said, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So my question is, who have you helped lately? Who have you gone out of your way for lately? Who have you given to lately? Where have you given lately some of what you have, some of your purple, some of your luxuries, some of your comfort? What have you given away to be a blessing to somebody else? I want you to know that hell should motivate us but not intimidate us. Let, let me remind you again, I don't have to go to hell. I don't even have to get on a ride at Disney World I don't want to give, get on. My wife, she goes on the roller coasters. I follow her to the roller coaster. And she goes, you sure you don't want to go? I go, I'll hold your purse. <laughs> I'm happier holding her purse than having a panic attack, getting on the dumb ride and freaking me out. I mean, I had to work up to Slinky Dog. I mean, right? I don't have to be afraid of roller coasters. Why? Because I don't have to go on them. If you're a Christian, you don't have to be afraid of hell. Why? You don't have to go on it. But it should motivate you to help your friends to want to see them in heaven. And I'm going to talk about the good news in a second. This is what Billy Graham said. I'm not going to heaven because I've preached to great crowds or read the Bible many times. I'm going to heaven just like the thief on the cross who said in the last moment, Lord, remember me. If Billy Graham could say that, guess what? We all say, Jesus, I just need you. Listen to what Jesus said. Number three, Jesus is the only way to heaven. You ever know the answers to a question? How many of you have ever watched Wheel of Fortune? We're showing our age in this group. Okay, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. When you've gone to a concert and everybody in front of you is sitting down, you know you've reached old age. <laughs> I went to a concert last week. Everybody in front of us sat the whole time. And I said, it's official. We're the youngest people here. But you're watching Wheel of Fortune. What they do is they play Jeopardy first so you can feel dumb. And then they put on Wheel of Fortune so you can feel smart. Because they try to pretend that you wouldn't know the answer. You've got to be smart to know this answer. Bowl of rice. You see that? I got that one. Sometimes during that game, they do put the letters up at the end and you can instantly see the person's face. Oh, I'm winning. I know the answer. When I told the kids earlier how awesome heaven is, can I tell you it's better than anything you've ever experienced? No more pain, no more suffering. No matter what you think about heaven or how awesome you think it is, there's going to be a day that you show up at heaven's gates and you're going to be like, whoa. Let's read the verse. Jesus said this to the disciples at the Lord's Supper. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that weren't so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Isn't that awesome? You don't even need an inspector. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me. Not only are you going to be escorted by angels, Jesus is going to be there. When you get to heaven, if there is a question, which there might be, why should I let you into heaven? Then Jesus will say, it's okay, he's with me. Or she's with me. You, you think there's a better answer? There's no better, there's no, I did this or I did that. It's, I'm with him. Come on in. And then it continues. You know the place where I'm going. Jesus, or Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know your, the way? Don't you love Thomas? We call him Doubting Thomas. When we get to heaven, he's going to be like, that was one time. <laughs> right? Like, can't you just call me Tom? Disciple Tom. What do I have to be Doubting Thomas? Disciple Tom is fine. I think the first thousand years he's going to deal with that. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Between the story of Lazarus and this story of Jesus telling his disciples, we recognize that the way to heaven is through Christ. And it's going to be more amazing than you ever know. A few Christmases ago, Jenna, months ahead, had asked for a computer. Dad, I want the computer. I want this kind of computer. Dad, I want a computer. I want this kind of computer. I had already bought it. Christmas Day arrives, I leave the computer in my room. She opens everything else. Everybody opens everything. We're just all sitting there. And you can see how disappointed she is. She's, I asked for that computer 42 times. Trust me, I remember all 42. <laughs> and finally, I looked at her and I said, Jenna, I think I forgot one of the gifts for somebody in the bedroom. Can you go get it? She goes in and picks up the gift. It doesn't have a label on it. She walks out. Looks about the right size. She's looking at me, looking at the gift, looking at me, looking at the gift. Who's this for, Dad? It's for you, Jenna. <laughs> oh. She cried. I laughed. Because I already knew what the answer was. Do you realize Jesus is standing at the gate? When you get to heaven, you think you know how awesome it's going to be. You're going to be so blown away. And he's going to be like, I knew it'd be better than you thought. That's your final challenge. We can live in peace knowing that Jesus is the way. You, if you're a believer, you already know the answer. And if you're not a believer, I want to encourage you. Check out the claims of Christ. Maybe you're on the doubt side and that's okay. But, but begin to check out the claim. See what the Bible says. Don't, don't, not, don't just listen to me. Look at what Scripture says. See what Jesus said about himself. And then say, have I ever surrendered my life to him? I ever, just like the disciples, recognize that Jesus died and rose again for my sins to pay for my sins, for my mess ups, for my mistakes. And when I surrender to him, what happens? He gives me eternal life and takes death from me. He gives me his righteousness and takes my sin. That's what the cross represents. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. We're going to close in prayer and then we have a great song and our offering to close the service. But I want to encourage you. Remember what great things are in store for each of us who've given our lives to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Lord, I thank you for the story of Lazarus, which has so many truths to it. But I especially thank you for your sacrifice, your grace for us. That while we were yet sinners, you died for us. So that we could spend eternity with you. Lord, I pray not only would we be assured in our salvation and knowing that you've saved us. But Lord, that we'd also look for opportunities to help others to find their way home to you. Thank you for these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen.